Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. We made USAA insurance to help you save. Take advantage of discounts when you cover your home and your ride. Discover how we're helping members save at usaa.com slash bundle. Restrictions apply. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi, I'm Michelle Obama. And in my podcast, I talk about so many of the lessons I've learned that are centered around finding your inner confidence, understanding your own story, and persisting even if it feels like people are judging and watching your every move. I get into this and a lot of other meaningful topics with some of my closest friends on my podcast, The Light. The Light Podcast is presented by Starbucks. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. Hello, this is Black Menopause and Beyond, and this is Anita Powell. I do apologise, I'm a bit husky today because I've been Ooh. blessed <laughs> with, with with the lurgy. So if you wonder oh. why, oh, Anita's voice is broken, it's it's because I've got, <laughs> I've got lurgy. But um, today in the podcast, I am interviewing fabulous Belinda Ajayi. She is someone I've known for 17 years. I know, and you're thinking I'm only 18. How is that possible? But it is. <laughs> uh, Belinda is a 55 year old, young, I should say, mm-hmm. <laughs> post menopausal woman. And um, she's going to talk to us a bit about her journey with her health over the past, say, 10 years ago, since she's noticed symptoms which could be peri and, um, and menopausal symptoms. So, Belinda, tell us a bit more about you. Okay. Good morning, Anita. Gosh. 17 years. Good heavens. Where did the time go? That's strange. I know. Isn't it? And we're only 18. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> forever young. <laughs> if only. Oh my God. Yeah. So, about me. Well, I'm an educationalist. You know, I, I do, you know, I do tuition. Um, what else do I do? I work, I've worked a lot as a teaching assistant, you know, so supporting children that have barriers to their learning, et cetera. And that's all been very good. You know, recently I've decided to change what I'm doing a little bit. I've had to tweak things um, so that I can think about my health or have time to, you know, put my health in order. You know, it's very hard to kind of hold down a full time job and have time to get to that gym or to that yoga session or even to have enough time with yourself because I found I was coming home from school and thinking oh my god I've got to cook got to do this got to do a tuition you know so the evenings were quite busy so I had to kind of make a very hard decision and think okay the day job has got to change I need time I need time to get to that swimming pool I need time to to breathe I need time to recover after a painful night see living with osteoarthritis often it's painful when you're lying down and that that sounds weird doesn't it you know because you expect to be lying down and have peace but you lie down and your bones hurt you know so by morning you're quite exhausted you know because every night movement is a pain so um I decided to stop the day job unfortunately and use the daytime to kind of swim, rest, walk, you know, just do things that are really, 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 really going to benefit me and um, save the evening time for for tuition. And that, that, that balance seemed to help. And I think it helped me overall because when you talk about menopause, you're talking about sleepless nights, you're talking about hot flushes, you're talking about aches, brain fog. Well, I changed up what I was doing. A lot of those symptoms seemed to kind of minimise because I could manage them. You know, I wasn't trying to juggle them with a full-time job, you know. 
But so that's where I am now. And another great thing that's happened now, Anita, is that there's more time to art, you know, for art. There's more time to draw and paint and connect with other artists, you know. So this is a really great time, you know. It really will it really is good to kind of have the time just to, you know, find out more about myself, you know? So that's that's good. Do you know if your osteoarthritis is, is somehow connected to your menopause? Well, it's connected to actually connected to a fall. You know, when I was working at a school, you know, I came out of one school, I was rushing to a next school, you know, picking up babies and kids on the way and got to the meeting I was attending. It was actually a book reading or something. Tripped over a chair, baby went flying, somebody caught her. My knee twisted up and um, <laughs> we're never the same since, you know, especially as, you know, you try to take time off work and it never looks good. There's always pressure to co- go back early, you know, so I returned to work before I was ready and um, the knee was never quite the same <laughs> ever. So how long ago was this? This was, um, how old is that child now? So it must have been about 22 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Because I've just read here. I'll just read out to you what I've found on a website oh. called uh, uh, versusarthritis.org. Oh, yeah, um, I know that one. You know, okay. Oh. So uh, the question is, can menopause worsen, worsen osteoarthritis? And the response is, they can have a significant impact on the day-to-day life, and sometimes they can even overlap with arthritis symptoms, which can make oh. it even trickier to get a diagnosis as well as sharing similar symptoms. The menopause can also uh, make pre-existing arthritis symptoms worse. Oh, God, I hear so, that. <laughs> so has anyone said to you over the past 10 years when you've been going through your other symptoms, which could be associated with menopause, mm. that actually your pre-existing issue could be heightened um, with the hormonal change? No, not at all. I mean... I've never had a conversation with a GP or anything like that about hormonal hormones or hormonal change at all. No, 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 no. Really? No. I've all I've known is I know I've got this osteoarthritis that gets worse with time. I know I've been talking to my doctors and health put practitioners about um what do we talk about we talk about weight loss we talk about you know healthy eating we talk about staying away from white foods you know like white sugar white flour white pasta white rice you know moving to brown you know but we've never had that conversation about um hormones you know so I've always been kind of conscious about my weight because I know the less weight I'm carrying around the happier my knees would be yeah but We've never linked it to menopause at all. You know, like I said, we've never had a conversation about menopause. Menopause has never been a conversation. It's yeah. always been mental health or or, or pain relief <laughs> or, or physio, you know. I mean, I found another um, something else as well <clears throat> on the website called www.caringmedical.com. And it says that estrogen deficiency is known to affect the development of, of osteoarthritis and menopause, um, menopause or home therapy suggested to be related to development. Oh, and uh, the development of uh, osteoarthritis. Oh. Okay. Oh, so, so there's loads of information out there. Yeah. But I, think, I think at the end of the day, we're not doctors, so we don't know if your, your pain is related to your hormone change. Um, mm-hmm. We would like to think that your doctor who you've been seeing for 20 odd years on the topic would know. We'd like to think. Yeah, we'd like um, to. But really why we're talking today is that you've had so many symptoms you've been struggling with, mm. struggling, struggling with, and you've had numerous doctor's appointments over like a decade mm-hmm. and no one's ever added a... No, I did one and two together to give yeah. the number two to you, which is, could it be either influenced by, caused by uh, menopause? And that's really why we're here, here really, because you, yes. are, you represent um, a lot of women 
And you also represent, you know, your voice and your story is very representative of a lot of black women. Mm-hmm. Um, so not only do does the medical world not 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 inform you or give you the possibility of so as as you say and i've heard this as well you know you need to lose weight people tell you and we're not arguing that we don't need to lose weight because that's yeah. part of our journey but also one of the of things course. you have to deal with when you get to a certain age is that it's harder <laughs> to lose weight so it's not like we're ignoring them. we're trying very hard yeah yeah but it's just it's, it's harder um but one of the things that we're saying is that that like for every woman of our age, we also have this additional burden, which is the menopause. And we've got mm-hmm. all this time in our in, in that human race where doctors must know about mm-hmm. hormonal change and mm-hmm. they've never educated us on it. So yeah. the doctor never says, you know, you, you're losing weight and, oh, um, it would be better for you to read up on the menopause. Here's a leaflet um, yeah. because you've reached a stage of your life where you need to understand that your body's changing. And, 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 and that's that's very common for all women. Tell you, that would have been helpful. You know, that would have drawn my attention to perimenopause if that was given to me. Yeah. You know, I don't, it's kind of, it's kind of weird because in the throes of life, you know, in the busyness and the juggling, it's it's easy to miss that perimenopause phase because you don't know when it's going to start. Because that can start at well, can start at any time, you know. So it's easy to kind of think, oh my god. Yeah, but it's easy if you don't know it's happening. Yeah, perimenopause can last for, for between for some people between four to ten years. Mm. So think I mean, about four of, to ten years of decline. Absolutely, and the thing is, a lot of people I know, a lot of women I know, are still having periods at fifty four. I didn't know that was a thing, mm. you know. The body is so bizarre, you know. So mm. there should be so much more of a conversation because, oh, my God, we go through, as women, we go through so much. We juggle so much. There, someone needs to say there needs to be a point where people are saying, oh, hang on, you know, you're going to have to start being a bit more kind of careful and look after yourself more because you're probably, you know, this um, perimenopause is going to kick in soon. So you're going to have to change up how you do things. You know, so there's no warning. There's no nothing. It, everything just kind of comes upon you. You know, these different sensations and feelings, and they probably creep up and creep up. But we don't know. <laughs> you know, we don't know what's creeping up and creeping up. We don't know why our moods are changing, our feelings are changing, why things are suddenly becoming more stressful because we're just not aware. It's that lack of awareness. I feel I feel bad for myself that I had that such a lack of awareness. You know. You know, what what could have been something perfectly normal that was happening to my body, you know, I didn't know. I mean, I think as well, um, there's just a lack of discussion Mm. and education around the whole female body and the menstrual area from teenage. The only time we talk about it is in relation to pregnancy. Mm. Um, Mm. And then we openly talk about pregnancy, but it's all connected, our pregnancy and our menstrual and our hormones. Um, But that's the only area publicly we feel comfortable talking about. And that's because we give birth to children who belong, you know, and the children are collected to men. That's the, uh, beyond beyond the before pregnancy and after, there Mm. there is an element of taboo and squeamishness. Um, Mm. And I think it has something to do with historically, gynecology has been, um, been driven by by male male medical people, and the only bit that interested them oh. is the bit relating to giving birth to children because we were giving birth to their children. Oh, um, <laughs> um, and I think the bit before and after, I think they just haven't valued or researched effectively. I feel. Yeah. But another thing, I'm just thinking as I'm talking to you, is it just here or is it everywhere? Because everywhere. You know- everywhere but the, but but how they deal with it's different in different countries so yeah. for it's what, what i understand in gynecology um as a topic area in germany is treated very much more seriously so mm. I, i've been informed that um women go and see a gynecologist on a regular basis whereas here most women never see a gynecologist and if they do it's during pregnancy if they have a problem so oh. um and 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 some people go to see a gynecologist as for an MOT. 
Oh God, uh, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> and good. different. Yeah, in different countries, the relationship with gynecology. So, mm-hmm. and gynecology is the area that specialises in the female system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Um, that there are more gynecologists per per females in within the country. There are um, women within their lifetime see more gynecologists, um, and the conversation around menopause is different at the moment from what i understand Mm. the uk we're shouting about the menopause is one of the loudest yeah (laughs) yeah what i understand because what it is i'm on a um i'm on an international um consultancy board where we talk about the topic of menopause Mm. and i'm on this board with people from all over europe um, oh, yeah, so and they talk about the different experiences of menopause for different mm. countries. Um, so Spain, Portugal, Italy, they just sound very different. Mm. Um, and some places it's um, garden quality is very much private, it's not okay. so much. Um, because our welfare system and our health system is different in our yeah. countries. For some people, they see a gynecologist more often, but they know they have to put their hand in their pocket and go and see. But yeah. it has an impact on the lower social economic groups who can't afford yeah. it full stop. Um, have you have you spoken to have you um got any kind of info on say black Americans or Brazilians? You know those places where there's lots of black women, you know? Because I know in Europe, I know we've got lots of black people that have migrated there and stuff. I don't know how loud they are. But what about, say, you know, in America? I mean... Most of the research around the menopause of black women has been in America. So there's a, a report... Oh, God, I've got... There was a report called the Swan Report. So yeah. I'm looking through my paperwork to see where it was based, the Swan yeah. Report. I've got loads of paperwork in front of me. So, because um, I know Americans really celebrate, you know, when the girls, you know, have their first menstruals, you know, and it, I wonder if they carry on to celebrate kind of menopause. I just wonder because because here we don't even celebrate when our daughters have their first period, you know. So I wonder, wonder if the discussion is slightly different with American women, Black American women. At the moment, the most important paper that's spoken about with regards to black women is called is called the report. It's called the Swan Report, which is the study of women's health across the nation, and mm. it was produced on behalf of the North American Menopause Society. Yeah, mm. so that that and that's quite recent, from what I understand. That's in the past few years, and that's highlighted that there are definitely differences in ethnicities and it's also taken into consideration mm-hmm. life experiences um, uh, for menopause i forgot the word that was used yeah so it does take into i can't find the exact word but it does there are reports out there which does take into consideration social um and cultural um diversities mm. because one of the reasons why they believe that black women have um increased struggle with regards to menopause and to be honest with you loads of health issues yeah. is because there, there are other things in place which have an impact on mm. the, the, the impact of menopause yeah. so on, on a day-to-day basis black black people will like to suffer with cardiovascular issues and with diabetes Oh, goodness. So that's a high rate. And then you have mm. menopause on top, so it amplifies it. But also yeah. with regards to social inequalities, black people are more likely to struggle with regards to poverty, uh, mm. problems with housing um, mm. and all these things. So what happens is that there's more there's more layers and when yeah. there's more layers, um, health issues come along and they're amplified. Absolutely. So that's, that's why... I don't on the medical side there's a conversation there and I'm not a medical person yeah. where mm-hmm. black women are not included enough in their research and therefore when they decide you know, this is the piece of medication that you can take mm-hmm. you know, it either some people feel uh, yeah. well, I'm not a medical person please don't take this as being gospel <laughs> <laughs> some people feel <laughs> yeah because I'm not you know I haven't got a PhD uh, do you know <laughs> I've, just got, I've got a degree and it's not it's, it's in business <laughs> studies it's not in medicine um but some women everyday women are concerned that 
um, the medication that are designed either doesn't work well for women of colour because it hasn't been designed for women of colour. And oh, apparently there are differences. Like black women are more likely to have high levels of oestrogen and collagen oh. and blah, 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 and all these different things. So there, oh, there are yeah. slight cultural differences no, no, in the makeup no. of but, women. But they know that. Medical people know how we're wired because, you know, they, they treat everybody every day. So they must see all these differences in their patients. So I don't think they care. I think that's right, then. I don't think we need our kids to train up as doctors and and to go and study medicine and kind of do something. Somebody needs to care because this isn't going away, is it? That's I mean, I think, I think what it is. I think what it is when it comes to medicine and science. There's a default presumption that that Europe and America are the most important. Yeah, so I've just read the Swan Report, and yes. the Swan Report said something about um, what was the title of it? The Swan Report is a study of women's health across the nation, but that's mm-hmm. because that's across America. There's a presumption. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so even though it looks at black women, it's it's, it's across America, and yeah. I think in um, so I think what happens is that even though they're studying medication that will be used worldwide, I'm sure yeah. the people. I'm sure uh, people in different countries, developing countries in Africa oh. and Asia, if they can oh. afford them, they're using the same medication that's developed in Europe. Yeah. Oh. But their their social, biological and um, needs aren't taken into account in research. Oh. We need more research. We need a lot more research. Yeah. 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 We need yeah. A lot more. So okay. I think that's where one. The, but the, but as I said, I'm not medical. But people have concerns that either medicine is not fully designed to um, for us to optimize on. Yeah. yeah. So it could yeah. it could be that if black women do, I don't know. But if they do have high levels of estrogen, um, if you're if you're doing research and no none of your sample base have high levels of estrogen, does yeah. it have an impact on the um, outcomes and what you decide to find the medicine? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not a medical person, but it's that question out there. Yeah. So, I mean, I did hear of a black woman who tried HRT um, kind of support, but um, it didn't agree with her. It didn't it didn't help her at all. She had to take antidepressants instead. Mm. You know. So it's like, oh, I don't know. So I kind of say to myself, what's in the antidepressant that helps with menopause? I guess it's the low mood bit and the anxiety bit. Maybe that's yeah. the bit kind of helps but what about everything else because the antidepressants not going to help with um your cardiovascular and your knee pain and <laughs> and everything else you know so it's you're putting a uh what's it called like a plaster on some things but everything else has been left to kind of you know fester it doesn't it's not it's not a long time solution is it, it it's yeah. not a long time solution it's there's inequality yeah, yeah. because because and it's something that reflects apparently throughout, throughout the whole the whole medical field. Apparently, I mean, as I say, I'm not a doctor, so I'm based on um, discussions with people, and I'm very careful who I pick as sources. I don't, I don't, I don't use YouTube as the source of my um, knowledge. <laughs> so I do listen to doctors when they talk yeah. and people who who work in spaces supporting women. Mm-hmm. I do know, but this is based on my experience. Yeah. I know more women. Who, um, and out of all the women I know who take HRT and struggle, mm. more of them are likely to be brown and black. More oh. of them, it's a high ratio. Well, that, that high goes, ratio. That goes to show, and yeah, that just goes to show that high ratio. That, that, that HRT is not made for for black women. We and need this, our we need our own. <laughs> yeah. So I don't I I don't know whether it's just bad luck. So I, okay. if I was to look at how many people I know who are who are on HRT, the mm. way she, um I know more women who are white who take HRT. Yeah. If I look at all the women I've spoken to who have concerns about um struggles with HRT, yeah. ethnic minorities um are more than uh, white women take HRT. I, I hear more problems. So, based yeah. on my lived experience, there is an element of why isn't it working mm-hmm. so effectively? And 
Yeah, why is it working? I, yeah, because all I hear is, oh, God, it's amazing. Take it. Um, I know loads of women who have started it and come off it because it doesn't agree yeah. with them. Constant bleeding, developing a, if it, polyps. I know a few oh, w- women, polyps, um, which 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 is apparently a concern. <laughs> um, but anyway, Belinda, more about you rather than general okay. stuff that... I'm so interested. Honestly, it's like you've opened a whole new world to me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because the thing is that when you do go to um, sessions which talk about menopause, yeah. they don't they don't have the same dialogue as me. And I, no. as I, say, I don't I don't I don't specialize in medical delivery. I, I will continually yeah. say that I'm a menopause activist and I facilitate peer discussion. So I run yeah. a, a peer group in the town that I live in. Um, and also I'm part, a co-founder of Black Women in Menopause, where we do every two months, we do an online session where we get mm. people, you know, to, so we do that. That's yeah. what we do every That's that sounds um, really good. And that's why I've learned all the stuff that I've learned. So it's yeah, not just about... It's opened my eyes. I want to I wanna learn more. You know, I've got daughters. I've yeah. got friends. I've got young people that I know. I want to learn more. I want to be able to help them so that they don't, you know, they don't suffer the way I've um, suffered, you know? Yes. I, yeah. want, I want their journey to be easier, you know? I want them to feel empowered, you know, mm. as they as they grow and change, because menopause doesn't it shouldn't be, um, you know, the end of your of your kind of healthy life. You know, it's it's the next step. You're supposed to go through it with grace, I'm sure. You know, with the support and with whatever um, you know kind of medical support you need, you're supposed to go through that change. I mean, mm. I mean, women are not supposed to stop feeling themselves you know feeling like a whole person at 50 or 55 you know yeah you know, there's, there's more to us there's we have so much more to offer but we need to feel well to to participate in this journey i mean the average um um oh, i can't remember the exact words but oh, the average women live to about i think 79 or 80 so mm. if you turn 50, that's still 30 years of adulthood. Mm. That's actually only halfway through adulthood because if you mm. become an adult when you're 18 and then you go and then you hit 50, that's only 32 years. That's it. And then we've got another 30 it? years. So actually, yeah, those we're 30 halfway years through your, adulthood. And they should be your best years because you've had the difficulty and the struggles of raising your family and juggling yeah. everything. You know, by the time you get to 50, you know, you should be starting to feel blessed. You know, your mm. children are growing. You know, the demands have changed. You know, you're feeling more confident in yourself. You shouldn't mm. be feeling washed out, drained, stressed, low, tired, in pain. That's mm. not how to do it. You know, yeah. we would need to feel. You know, we need to feel stronger. I mean, otherwise, I mean, look at um, look at the presidents. Look how old the American presidents are. I know. So a woman trying to go through that without kind of medical su- support, you know, with due to menopause, you know, while these guys are living their best life in their seventies and eighties, trying to run countries, we're on our knees, you know, trying to just get a decent night's sleep. Yeah. that's not right exactly <laughs> strange what's happening hey is this a conspiracy are they trying to keep us down what's going on <laughs> Belinda stop it <laughs> <laughs> but, um... <laughs> they've had their children throw them on the scrap heap <laughs> <laughs> I mean also one of the things that have an impact on menopause for black women mm. is that actually statistically black women are more likely to have additional struggles so mm. we're more likely you know older black women are actually more likely to be single older black women are more likely to um have financial insecurity in their older age they're more likely to be still balancing the struggle of raising children they're more likely to be balancing the struggle of helping the elderly you know their parents mm-hmm. um so they have a a higher statistically a higher chance of having these additional burdens where we're still important carers Mm. to elderly and children but society doesn't care for us there we go there we go respond to that (laughs) right okay i mean i can respond to that via 
my own story, you know, the Berlin, well, it's part of my story, you know. I mean, okay, it's not nice to kind of feel that you're falling into kind of categories or stereotypes, you know, it's not, it's not nice. But we can champion those stereotypes by doing well, you know. And one thing I have learned is that, okay, I might not have much, you know, kind of financially. Um and yeah, I am single, you know, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I, it's, it's just me, you know, and I, I have juggled the upbringing of my children, you know, but um, you have to be very, very strong inside, you know, you cannot let society pull you down, you really have to keep fighting, you know, you have to be, you have to be tough in this life, I've realised, you know, and I'm, I, I tell you, I, I'm, I feel blessed. Because although I've done most things by myself, and although I've had to, oh my God, you wouldn't believe. I mean, Anita, guess how many houses I've lived in? Guess how many times I've moved in the last, um, say, 18 years? Go on, just give a number. Guess how many times I've had to move Ten. out? 10. That's too far. Eight, Anita. Eight. <laughs> Eight. Because I know you've moved that. I know you. So yeah. I, I knew, I knew no. it was all right. I mean, the average person moves them. every, what, seven years or so? Um, Gosh, honestly, now that alone is a stress, you know, yeah. from small social house. Oh, I want to try and better myself. Let me try the private sector. And then you move to the private sector, you end up with some dodgy landlord. And then you have to move again, then you move again. And the thing is, all the time you're carrying your kids, you're carrying your stresses, you're carrying your elderly parent that you have to manage. You know, you're carrying all your things, your job. Everything hap- Everything has to continue while you're juggling. You know, real juggles. Yeah. And the thing is, if you have pride about yourself, you still want to hold yourself, you know, you want to look dignified. You want to, you know, you don't want to look like you, you're downtrodden, you know. So you're trying to balance and juggle so many balls, you know. Mm. And um, it was so many, was it last year I moved, you know, I had my eighth move back into, say, a social house, you know, social housing. And I felt, oh, at last I can breathe, you know, I can breathe. And, um I just found the whole experience overwhelming because I was exhausted. I was so, so exhausted from the constant moving, the constant, every time you move, yeah, you have to chuck things away, you know? Yeah. Um, Because you have, not that you've got, not that you're a hoarder or not that you've got too much stuff, but every time you move, you've got to accommodate the new accommodation, Mm. you know? So every time you move, you're throwing part of yourself away. Mm. part of your things things that you love and care about and have worked hard for you've got to check them out because maybe this time there's no garden so you don't need your lawnmower you don't need your um barbecue kit you don't need your garden chairs get rid sell them do whatever you like get rid and I kind of used to say to myself gosh I feel so you know oh do I feel envious or do I feel I don't know how I feel but all I know is that some people have been in the same house for over 20 years and they've just got their things around them you know and it must be so wonderful to feel settled you know the past 18 years I felt so unsettled and so kind of tired so tired having to um, adjust to different homes and houses and my kids must have felt the same way too you know yeah, and, and that's that's the common thing about yeah. um, women, um, black women, um, mm. more so than Asian. I think it's a different experience with Asian women. Yes. Um, it's it's the fact that we are independent. I would say mm. as women, but it takes uh, its toll, you know. And it's and I would say that we are strong, but I think it's at our own detriment. I think we're strong yeah. because we have to be. I don't think Absolutely. it's strong because we're Absolutely. empowered. I think yeah. we have lost power. We're disempowered. Ooh. But to yes. get through Monday to Friday, we have to kind of put a battery up our backsides to empower us. I tell you. No, I tell you, it's felt like that, honestly. But do you know what? Let me see. In the past few years, I was more, once the period stopped, say my period stopped at 50. So that's when I thought, oh, okay, menopause. Yes, this has stopped. You know, I knew nothing about perimenopause, but I thought, oh, menopause, this period stopped. So something. So I made a kind of conscious decision in my life to think, okay, things have to start being a bit different. You know, with change, I can see that the kids are growing. So it's, I need to kind of start looking after myself because I also had a scare. I noticed that a lot of um, 
black women were suddenly just dropping dead, you know, just dying in their sleep or having some illness. And was this before just, COVID or after COVID? This is a little bit before and a little bit after. Definitely after. Oh, no, I don't know what was happening. Yeah, because I wouldn't be surprised it was connected to COVID. Yeah, but yeah. people were just kind of dying. I know, know I didn't. I know. There was like yeah. a stage where like, there were so many funerals. Mm. Yeah, literally, and it was amplified. It was yeah. way more. Uh, and this is a prior COVID. Yeah. Prior COVID. Loads of people dying. Loads. I tell you. People were just kind of dropping, dropping. I was like, oh, how old was she? How old? Oh, 54. Oh, you know, then another one, 52, 56. And I thought, oh, God, no, I need to do something different, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I started, I used to say, to say to myself, I've still got kids to raise. I need to stop this juggle, juggle, juggle. You know, it's mm-hmm. not going to work. And I'd go to the doctors and they'll say, well, Lindsay, you need to start looking after yourself, you know? You really, and, you know, and the way they were looking at me is if to say, mm. and I thought, they must know something about my health that I don't know. And then they're not saying I need to start looking afterwards. So I consciously said, OK, <laughs> I need to finally, finally get selfish and start looking after myself. I don't understand menopause, but I know I'm getting older and I know I have to change what I'm doing. You know, I know I've got to make sure I'm eating differently, make sure I'm resting and make sure I'm not trying to carry everybody. You know, yeah. I don't. I don't carry everybody now. You know, I just now live in a, a home with my youngest child and my other daughter. You know, she will come back from uni and she'll stay, but she'll probably work and travel. You know, she likes, she likes, um, you know, she likes languages and stuff. So she'll probably, probably live abroad, you know, who knows? But all I know now is that I, I take my life seriously and like gently. I'm very gentle to myself. Mm. You know, I'm very, very kind to myself. You know, I make sure I live a very simple, comfortable life. I mean, I don't have money at all. I do have money, but I do have my house, you know, so I really, really move gently. You know, I mean, mobility makes me walk slow, <laughs> so I don't walk fast anyway. But I just, you know, I do move gently. I do. I'm trying to give myself a very gentle experience. And it's new to me because I'm not used to looking after myself at all. I'm not used to resting. I'm not used to um, keeping my mind simple and, you know, and without overcrowding it, you know. I've become more uh, mindful with myself. Okay. You know, that's the thing. I've become more mindful. There are times, get this, where I'll just sit in an absolutely silent room and just listen to my own breathing, you know, just absolutely connect with self, you know, because I kind of thought, if I don't slow down, you know, I won't be here much longer, yeah. you know, and that's what I could actually feel, you know. There was a time before COVID where, I don't know what I was going through. I don't know if it was uh, the menopause, anxiety. It could have been depression. But I felt so, so tired. I felt, do you know what? Is this, is this, the, is this the end? Am, am I dying? You know, I really felt, I felt so drained and so tired and so overwhelmed with everything. I just felt, oh, it's too much. And that wasn't just kind of out of the blue. If I looked at what I was doing, I could understand why I was feeling like that. I was trying to support family in Nigeria. I was trying to support my four kids. I was trying to support myself. I was trying to work. I was trying to juggle. I was trying to cope with, uh, you know, with the landlord. I was, you know, I was trying to cope with so many things that any normal person <laughs> wouldn't even manage one of those things, you know. But And so I actually fully understood what I was doing. I was doing way too much. Yeah, you know, and you were supported because the thing is that some people might be listening and they might be white, white because white people do this to this podcast, yeah, Yeah, and they might think, well, all women go through that, and I think this is something that people need to understand. That when we talk about black menopause and the lived experience, biologically, mm-hmm. as I said, I'm not a med- medical person. I don't know fully about <laughs> the impact of HRD and blah, blah, blah. But I, I know when it comes to lived experience, as a community worker, people yeah. of colour have loads of barriers, yeah? And it could be that white working class also have barriers as well, mm-hmm. yeah? We have a high proportion um we have a higher t- tendency of barriers. We experience less privilege. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes privilege, privilege counteracts barriers. So say, so say for instance, um, 
know, you're economically struggling, whatever, but you have a partner, yeah, and therefore that partner mm. is a buffer zone, hopefully, mm. with economically. Yeah. Or even yeah. if the par- partner's not earning enough money for the household, mm. the household is still struggling. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you want to go out for a walk um, at midnight, um, hopefully you can leave your children with your partner um, yeah. and go out for a walk. If you're a person on your own and you don't have that support system, mm. then you can't. And that could be your only me time. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then what happens is that we're 50, we're half a century, which and my son continually reminds me. And then we, <laughs> yeah. And then that what happens is that if you then add a cum- cumulative, cumulative um, impact of a lack of support mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, loads of barriers but not much privilege and you multiply it by 50 years as well as racism and mm-hmm. um, and everything like that, it, ha- it, adds, it becomes a big, massive ball, a big, massive ball. And that's – this is what people of colour have to deal with, this massive um, – Kind of um, disadvantage which have been created over cent- you know decades of their life, <clears throat> um, and that's why things become an additional burden. Um, and if you you know if you're poor and you're a man, then clearly you know you're experiencing disadvantage or whatever. But you mm. still have male privilege. There's there's still certain places that you walk into. And you still benefit. If you're poor and you're a man and you you find a girlfriend, guess what? Who cooks you dinner and washes your clothes and who is your house? A woman. So you may be poor and a man, but then you can yeah. actually go out and marry a servant. Women right, women to find a man to help them clean, to mm. find a man to do the cooking for them. That is virtually Ooh. impossible. Oh, but it could be. I know. Oh, Oh my goodness! Someone to come and make some really nice meals, you know. Yeah. Just gonna dance around the kitchen in the apron. Oh, yeah. wonderful! That would be good. <laughs> so, but if you're going through the menopause and you just need a bit more help around the house, or you need help um, doing stuff, and you're extra tired, you need to be cared for more. But mm. men very often marry carers. Women often don't marry carers. <laughs> That's the reality of it. But I yeah, need to look for a carer. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need a caring app, not a dating app. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, so Belinda, I mean, you've made. Can you just describe in a bit more detail your life choices that you've made? Because I know you've mentioned yoga and swimming. Can you just go a bit more into detail about what you've done and changed? Oh, what have I done now to change? Right. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. What I've done to change is absolutely change for yeah, change the way I work. Yeah, because although I absolutely adored working in schools, yeah, I love the kids, love the connection with everything. Um, because of the night, the morning is hard, the morning is painful. So now I use my morning to wake up slowly, get up slowly. Um, I like to do stretching, you know, wake up, stretch, stretch all those joints because everything hurts when we wake up. So take the time. You can't, this is not a thing you can do if you're running to work for, for half seven, eight o'clock, you know, so take my time to wake up, drink, um, you know, kind of um, hot drinks that are made with um turmeric ginger lemon lime you know all kinds of good things for my body you know um listen to wholesome podcasts like yours you know and just just in you know inspire myself educate myself you know take walks um say positive things to myself you know i choose my words really carefully now you know and um you know, just make sure I'm eating things that are good for my body. You know, I mean, when you don't have much money, you don't have many choices as what you actually buy. But, you know, you can, you know, you can look, you can be quite savvy. You know, you can look on those shelves in those markets and in the supermarkets and just pick a few green things, a few more greener things, leave a few oily things behind and, you know, just make little changes, little, little changes. And um, I've started swimming. I mean, I'm I'm not a natural swimmer, but I do like being in the water. I do like kind of moving around in the water. I like going to aquaerobics, you know, that's fun. When I'm in the water, I 
I'm smiling, you know, and that's really good for my soul, you know. I feel weightless, you know. I don't, <laughs> so that's quite nice, you know. So I'm trying to do little things to make myself feel happy. Um, I try to, I try what's the other thing I like doing? I mean, I'm social, but I'm not social. I like people's company, but I don't like people's company. So I like my own space. So I use my space to read. I use my space to draw. I use my space to, you know, just reflect, you know, and just grow as a person, you know. And I do enjoy the tuition that I do with young people and children because I want them to grow. I want them to have good life chances, you know. So that's very satisfying because it means that, you know, they can, you can talk to them on a level. You can enrich them as well as educate them, you know. So that is a, you know, that's a quite a nice, satisfying profession to be in. And it works with my health. You know, it's not a thing I have to do in the morning. I can time manage that perfectly to fit around my own kind of life circumstances. And, um, you know, when you get those results in, when they pass their exams and pass their SATs and pass all their papers, we rejoice. Honestly, we celebrate together. Honestly, we had like, I think it was a whole 100% pass rate this time, you know, we've sat, you know, the parents were coming to me and say, oh, Belinda, I'm so happy. My child has passed his stats, you know. You want to say to them, do you know what? In the larger scheme of things, it doesn't matter, you know. They'll be fine. Just look after their mental health, you know, just keep them happy. Just keep them learning, you know. But you kind of joy with them. You enjoy with them and you kind of celebrate with them and you just kind of, you know, you're happy that they're happy. You're happy that they're learning approach is working and you're happy that people are achieving you know so you know I'm just I'm just kind of learning as I'm going there's no rule book to this life is there there's no guidebook so we just have to just keep taking small steps and, and just moving forward as best we can you know we just have to be kind you know we have to be kind and have you noticed Nia you know like um in the workplace you kind of do get women in that are bosses and stuff Sometimes you kind of look at these women and you kind of think, don't they go through menopause or something? Because sometimes they're the hardest people to deal with, you know? Sometimes they can be so cruel to people that are struggling. It's like they've never struggled. It's never, I mean, mentally or physically, because sometimes they're very hard. Sometimes they're very hard and cold. And, um, you know, sometimes they really, really make life difficult for people that are clearly going through menopause. You know, there's no conversation in the workplace where, you know, a person can take you aside and say, you know what, this might be the start of menopause. This might be something, you know, you're going through. How can we help you? There's nothing. It's like those women turn into something militant and they don't care. You know, we've got to the stage in some workplaces yeah, where if you're not up to speed, there's no interest. Don't be there. We can't. You mean with, re- with regards to women more so than men? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're not going to spend ages on this because I've got a view on this because I'm really mm. conscious of your time. So I know you've yeah, got to go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I, I think honestly, talk too much. Was it you that talks too much? Which one? Both. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think this is kind of a knock knock on impact. I think of feminism. I think mm. I'm a feminist, and, and but I call myself an intersectional feminist. So I don't call myself mm. a feminine feminist. There's like this kind of space in the feminist world where um they want um they don't want equality to men they want to optimize on male power yeah mm. so there are some women who their ideology around feminism is not about being equal it's about they look at people of extreme power and mm. they just want to reach that same level yeah oh, so they don't it? want they don't want you to be equal to them no they don't want me to be equal to them. They mm-hmm. want to be able to optimise and be greater than you and me, even though we're all women and even though they're, they're, they're benefiting from um, feminist dialogue. So, yeah. you know, they're the type of people, yes, I'm a woman, I want equality in the boardroom. But actually what you really want is to run the boardroom because once you're there, yeah. you, don't, you don't encourage <laughs> other women to join you. Because <laughs> <laughs> these women aren't supporting women. That's the, yeah. that's the so they're talking Absolutely. about they want equality, they want equal power, they want access yeah. to the same income. Yeah, yeah. They get positions and power, and they're harder on women. They, yeah, don't, they don't want other women in their space. Yeah. Yeah, they're not supportive, so they use feminism 
to 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 actually benefit from male dominance. Once they're in that space of um, a, that space where they have entered, where Ooh. it's hard for women to enter, they yeah. then make it harder for other women. Exactly. Yeah. They want it for themselves. They want it for themselves. So actually, it's not feminism. They want a, they want a form of um, 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 male dominance, but in the skirt. They, <laughs> but anyway, well, but that's just that's got enough to do with menopause at all. And I've realised because women like that. Once I understood what they were about, it's it's yeah. not it's not a form of feminist femi- no, feminism, no. but they use feminism to get into the boardroom. Mm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so once so I worked that way, female charm to get to their boardroom, and then they absolutely yeah, they don't help other women. Around them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, they're harder on menopausal women. They're harder yeah. on ethnic minorities. They're harder on lower social economic group white working class women. They don't offer women equal pay. They don't create a system where women the women can follow up. And benefit from their their mm. them being but basically they they want to be Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher yeah. didn't, didn't help other women. Mm. She, mm. she fought to get where she was as a woman, yeah. and then she literally closed the glass exactly. door and cemented it over and didn't yeah. make it easier for other women. Exactly. She just stood there and fought men. Yeah, um, totally. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. That's my opinion. Oh, but, <laughs> But we'll talk about this another time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, with regards to in t- in two minutes, what what would you like to see as a future for women and menopause? Okay, I would like for the future. I would like to see that the conversation is absolutely out there, absolutely out there, and I'd also like to hear that. Do you know what? There's going to be funding for research into more kind of medical support for black women going through menopause. You know, I think we need some kind of trials and testings. Let's look into this. Let's give black women something to help them with their menopause. Let's do that. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, that would be because we 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 just not included much in research. Um, yeah, and also we do have different lived experiences. Even though yeah. even though. You know, you and I, I were born in this country and, you know, we, we can be, we can meet friends. We, we could, both of us got friends who are white and Asian. Yeah, yeah. Um, we get on really well. We've got loads of things in common. But actually, if you look at statistics and conversations, you notice that there are differences. Um, it's not, it's not yeah. nice. It's not, it's not fair, you know. Yeah. It's not it's, fair. It's, it's and not it's not a... nice for our friends because they don't, our friends who love us, they don't want to see us suffering. Yeah, I mean, nice. sometimes I don't understand it. I, I've had loads yeah. of conversations with exactly. people before who are my friends, and they don't get they don't uh, they don't they don't get that that they they may benefit from a certain degree of privilege. They don't understand mm-hmm. it, and you think, well, you've been my friend all this time. You've heard me moaning. Why don't you get it? You know, it's it's, it's also an element of not listening. Um, yeah. Some stuff, sometimes sometimes it is just about being female, but mm-hmm. sometimes it's it's a female and being something else. There's additional yeah. barriers. Um, yeah, no, we have and, to keep and women have to just support. fight for each other. Yeah, we can't rely I, think so. I think as as black women, I think also we can't rely on black men to fight for us. I think we just have to get out there. <laughs> Stop laughing, Belinda. We just get out there. <laughs> <laughs> you see my face? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think sometimes black women we have to advocate for ourselves, and yeah, we can't I rely on so. anyone else sometimes no, because no. even though we have people who have other ethnicities helping us um exactly. it's not their lived experience and so sometimes it's not accurate or they exactly. they they put their narrative um in front of your narrative to help us and it's just not the same and then the opposite sex they've got their own problems um mm. really so we yeah. let them get on with it so um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much belinda my pleasure. My and pleasure. Moan. <laughs> I'm not quite nice, actually. You know, I mean, I don't mean to moan. Oh, hey, it's good to have a little rant now and again, isn't it? <laughs> okay, right. Okay, I better let you go. It's okay. nice talking to you. I'll it's speak to you soon. Talking. I'll speak to you soon. soon. You stay strong. Okay. God bless. Take care, baby. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to the, today's podcast, and. I, was, I had a great time talking to Belinda and Belinda was a, an actual pleasure 
to interview because she was able to tell us a bit about her struggle, her story, dealing with osteoarthritis, dealing with constantly moving, dealing with the day-to-day struggle of being a menopausal woman um, in post-menopausal stage and struggling um, with finances, housing, children and also when her mum was alive and caring. So um, thank you very much for listening. If you could follow, like, listen to my podcast and, and my social media and keep up to date with all the things that I'm doing, that would be absolutely brilliant. Also, I've got a request out there to you. I I run a peer support group in the town that I live in and I'm trying to raise funds really for the group. So if anyone out there wants to, t- wants to support me and the work that I do around the podcast and also support me in um, providing a safe space where, where women can come and talk to um, other women about their menopause experience, please, 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 please donate to um, my GoFundMe and my, or just buy us a drink on, is it Kufi, um, which I will attach in the show notes. So if you want to support the work that I'm doing um, and support me, I will most appreciate it because a lot of stuff I do, I do at my own time and my own cost. So I would really appreciate and value all the, all the support that I receive. Have a great day. Trying to grab all the groceries in one trip? Oof, not how you would have done that. You know sometimes less is more. Like when you drive less and save with the USAA annual mileage discount. USAA, get a quote today. Hey. 